Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, uh, good evening uh, for those listening uh, from uh, Asia and our participants from Asia as well. I'm Mireya Solis, Director of the Center for East Asia Policy Studies. And I want to thank everybody for joining us for this second panel, where we will have a closer look at the reopening experiences from a broad range of economic sectors in East Asia. From the role of digital technologies, to the manufacturing sector and the operation of supply chains, to the food and beverage sector, property markets, and the travel and hospitality industry. The question of economic revitalization looms very large as the global health crisis has disrupted production and depressed consumption all over the world. We are in fact confronting the worst economic downturn since the Great Depression, and Asia has not escaped unscathed. On the contrary, the IMF's GDP projections for the 2020 year, for this year, are sovereign, 0% growth. Our purpose today is to provide a rich and granular, granular understanding of how different economic sectors in the region are coping with the pandemic, but also to gain insight into what reopening will bring about. What will the uh, new normal be as we attempt to restart economic activity while still battling the new coronavirus? We're thrilled to have a distinguished group of panelists with deep understanding of key economic sectors. Let me introduce them briefly in the order in which they will offer their initial remarks. Uh, Kai Fu Lee is the chairman and CEO of Sinovation Ventures, a company devoted to promoting high-tech entrepreneurship. Before that, Dr. Lee was president of Google China. And I should also note that he's a best-selling author with his book, AI Superpowers, China, Silicon Valley and the New World Order. Jane Sun is the Chief Executive Officer of the Trip.com Group with extensive experience in the online travel business. She has received many distinctions, including in 2017, when she was named as one of the most influential and outstanding business women by Forbes China. Kei Jirohora, is a chief representative of the Americas region for Mitsubishi Electric Corporation and the president and chief executive officer for Mitsubishi Electric US. Mr. Hora has been a leader in the electronics and manufacturing sector for more than three decades and brings expertise in industrial technology, strategic business development and marketing, particularly in Asian and North American markets. Terry Tsao is a global chief marketing officer and president of Semi Taiwan, where he leads a strategic operational and communication marketing. And prior to joining the Semiconductor Association, Mr. Tsao was managing director of International Data Corporation. And last but not least, Robert Greaves is the founder, chairman, and CEO of Hamilton Advisor, a strategic communications firm and he's also the 2019 chairman of the American Chamber of Commerce in Hong Kong. Previously, Mr. Greaves had a career in journalism, writing for The Times, The Economist, and Time Magazine. I would like to encourage everyone to send us your questions. We want to include you in the conversation, so please reach out to us via email or Twitter. And with that, I would like to turn things over to our moderator, my colleague, David Dollar, who is a senior fellow at the China Center and a leading scholar on the Chinese economy and global supply chains. With that, over to you, David. Uh, thank you very much, Maria. It's a great pleasure to moderate this discussion among this distinguished group of panelists. Uh, I won't say much to start because we want to get right into the discussion. We're interested in how sectors are recovering and getting back to operation, but I'm also interested in the longer term question of how sectors may change on a more permanent basis. And so we're gonna start with Kai Fu Li, and I hope everyone can stick to about five to seven minutes for their initial 
just comments. And I'll just remind you, you have to unmute your mic when you start. Please, Mr. Lee. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks for inviting me to this uh, panel. Uh, so my company, Sinovation, operates in China. We've been uh, back in business for the last uh, two months or so. Uh, after an initial period of problem, uh, I think the entrepreneurial environment is now uh, really uh, buzzing with uh, energy. We are uh, talking to companies using online mechanisms, but also able to now meet offline. So I think overall, uh, I would say the whole country is back um, up and running, including the sector of high tech entrepreneurship and uh, investment. But I think what might be more interesting to talk about is what are the technological implications of uh, post COVID-19. Uh, one that everyone talks about is digitization. We're spending much more time online with learning, um, telemedicine and uh, working. Uh, from home and having sessions like this. Uh, I think the important thing from a technology standpoint is that this forms a habit. And uh, habits take on the average 70 days to form. And that's just about the amount of time it takes for us to shift from old style meetings to new style and old style entertainment to new style and so on. And the further implication is that once things are digitized, where we're, we have more data. Once there's more data, then AI can be enabled. So a lot of opportunities like that will arise. To give you one example, one of the grand challenges and arguably could take uh, my whole lifetime and probably won't see the results is that of building a digital human uh, in real life, right? Building a robot that can touch and see and walk is so difficult. But when we're seeing each other, not in real life, but in video conferencing, building a digital human uh, like what you see of me uh, is really quite relatively easy. Something that's photorealistic, human-like, is engaging, speaks like humans. Uh, it's within reach right now. And what this means is that in the future, when you're in a video conferencing, listening to a lecture by a teacher, uh, talking to a, a, some, a, a chatbot for a, a human-looking chatbot for medical assistance, uh, getting customer support, being contacted by sales, you won't know if it's human or AI. And that I think is a big change riding on top of digitization. In terms of um, uh, uh, sectors that can ride this wave with AI and data, uh, of course, healthcare is at the very center. And that goes from a disease uh, pandemic prediction in the future, uh, things like wearables will Will, will create a lot more sensor data to make accurate predictions to avoid pandemics like this. And of course, uh, drug discovery um, and also uses of AI with all the data gathered in the future of smart uh, diagnosis um, and um, uh, smart radiology and so on and so forth. I believe in the future, it's inevitable that AI becomes a very powerful assistant to doctors and that will get accelerated by, by the pandemics. With education, about a billion children are taking classes remotely. Today, still largely by human teachers, but we are actually have a portfolio of companies that are building AI teachers that are indistinguishable from human teachers. And furthermore, has the exciting characteristic of being able to target content for each uh, student and making learning more fun, engaging with the quantitative results showing students are learning better. So these virtual teachers, I think is going to be a surprising thing uh, coming out of this. Uh, social distancing uh, makes us want to not have people contact people too much, especially those in jobs, in service jobs, transportation jobs, and uh, jobs that, uh, healthcare jobs that require a lot of contact. So the use of robotics from autonomous vehicles for delivery, uh, and robots for delivering medical supplies have been in, installed in China and really taking off. Now, the final uh, idea is a little um, uh, double-edged sword, and that is with the economic pressure that companies now face, uh, people look at cost cutting. And there are a lot of AI and high-tech technologies that for automation that have not had pervasive adoption. For example, RPA, robotic process automation. 
it, it basically is there to replace people doing routine white collar jobs. But some companies have been slow to adopt. But now that we're digitizing work anyway, rather than letting employees work from home doing routine job, why not have a software process? So more, so the, the uptake of RPA is just going through the roof worldwide and many jobs are being automated. These are jobs like uh, back office, uh, customer service, um, entry level uh, accounting, HR, legal, and so on. And once these jobs are automated, they're never coming back. So I'm quite uh, excited about the efficiency benefits, but also concerned that when some of these workers come, are ready to come back to work after the pandemic, the job may not be there. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Lee. That was very interesting and very focused time-wise, so I appreciate that. We're gonna turn now to Jane Sun, totally different sector, travel. It's been the sector that's probably been most hit by the coronavirus. Uh, so so uh, Jane, please. Thank you for having me. Uh, our sector is badly hit by the coronavirus. And I would like to walk you through the three stages uh, we have been, we are in, and we will be in. The first phase is the crisis mode. When China adopted the lockdown policy, hundreds and millions of uh, cancellation and the reordering came to our call center. So we have been working very hard to take our to take care of our customers. We launched 100 million uh, natural disaster relief fund to help our customers. We also bring in our partners to launch one billion. Uh, working capital for the ecosystem and 10 billion uh, loans to inject it in the travel industry just to make sure our partners are well protected and well supported. And also for our employees during this crisis mode, we adopted very swift measures to make sure uh, they are very well protected. Now, after January and February, at the end of March, we start to see the recovery. Uh, so if you look at the pollution rate in China, coal usage uh, in China, and also the export rate, all these indexes have seen a positive um, recovery, uh, which indicate a normalization of the China, Chinese economy. And it's also reflected gradually uh, in a travel industry. So we have to be very innovative to increase the confidence in the consumer's heart. So what we did is a couple of things. First of all, when we start uh, to recover uh, the travel industry, we need to make sure that the consumers who are so concerned about the virus are very well protected. So we adopted a safety standard for all the hotels, airlines, local tour operators, uh, rental car companies, so that the, uh, the locations are very well sanitized, temperatures are taken, uh, prevention uh, methods are adopted. And for those companies who adopt these safety standards, they got very good volumes at the beginning. Secondly, we also talk to our partners and our consumers. Uh, for example, for the hotels, the occupancy rate right now is very low at about 10% or 20%. However, the demand from the high-end customers is quite high because they have been locked down for so long, they're eager to travel. So what we did is to have um, talk to our hotel partners, uh, they uh, take out the, these perishable inventory and giving very good discount to the consumers. And in return, we ask our customers to prepay for these products. Uh, the deal they get is so good. Uh, for example, they will get a five-star hotel, two Michelin restaurant dinner, a free meal, uh, for breakfast uh, for only $150, which normally will sell at $500 US dollars. Uh, in return, our hotel partners will get some cash flows uh, to supplement their operations and reduce their loss. So we are very much uh, leading uh, the recovery in the process. And thirdly, we're also using all kinds of innovative methods to 
reach out to the market. For example, we use live streams to reach out at all the social platforms uh, using different methods uh, to wake the customers who have been sleeping uh, during the crisis mode. Uh, so by doing that, we have seen 50% recovery uh, during the last uh, Labor Day weekend. And uh, I'm very eager uh, to wait for the Congress meeting, which is going to take place at the end of May. Hopefully, the government will send a strong message uh, to resume the economic activities and encourage city to city, state to state tra travel. And by that time, uh, the travel industry will even uh, recover more to 80 to 90 percent compared to the last year. Now looking forward, the third stage will be challenging but rewarding. We have seen in the first uh, panel that uh, Korea, uh, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Vietnam, uh, even Singapore and Japan, uh, these countries are very disciplined and making sure uh, the outbreak of the virus is very well under control. So we are working very hard with the travel bureau in these countries and hopefully the government will have adopted a certain standard uh, like what we have in China. For example, in Shanghai, we have a green health code. And in Beijing, uh, the code is also green. So a person from Shanghai who has a green health code, when he or she travels to Beijing, he doesn't need to be quarantined. And if we can do that for bilateral uh, relationships between China and Korea or China or Vietnam, China and Singapore, that will expedite the inter-nation uh, uh, travel and further uh, recover uh, these uh, travel industry, which is badly needed. As we can see, travel accounts for 10% of the GDP and provides 10% of the job opportunity. So uh, at this moment, if we can collaboratively work together as one global one team, it will be very critical for the recovery uh, for Asia. And if it is, uh, if we hold Asia very strongly, then we will inject positively in the global economy. So hopefully uh, with the influential uh, uh, audience uh, today, we can work together and make it happen in the future. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And so now we're gonna turn to Kajiro Hora from Mitsubishi Electric. Hey, thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you, David and the media Sun for opportunity to join this panel today. So I'm Kajiro Hora from Mitsubishi Electric. So uh, my company have a diverse range of products used in many industries. Our product, my product uh, uh, include satellite, semiconductor, building systems, energy infrastructure, automotive electronics, the factory automation like that. And we have uh, around 140,000 employees overall. And also we have uh, many factory in US and also many in Asian countries such as China, Thailand, Vietnam, and Malaysia. And the same as the almost all manufacturers, COVID-19 continue to affect our business operations. Uh, to a certain extent, Mitsubishi Electric has been uh, able to navigate the operational and logistical challenge of the pandemic in the Asian region. So uh, first, uh, while Mitsubishi Electric uh, briefly closed uh, in February a portion of our factory in China. So uh, uh, we do not have the, any manufacturing operational in uh, Wuhan area. And the second, in recent years, uh, Japan has endured the disasters and unforeseen event, including massive earthquakes and incidents such as tsunami. Those impact of these types of events has served to accelerate our contingency planning for and ensure uh, that our supply chain is that diversified and resilient. So, we have also uh, uh, established the protocol uh, uh, whereby almost all our overseas factory have a backup in the form of a, a mother factory in Japan. So if a catastrophic event disrupt operations at one of our factory, 
uh, factory in Japan or the other uh, country is usually able to take on this additional capacity. However, uh, for uh, Mitsubishi Electric, a more significant reaction uh, reason for the slowing our production line in a certain sector like uh, HVAC or building system, factory automation and transportation is uh, decreased market demand uh, given massive financial uh, uncertainties. So from a financial perspective, uh, we are currently forecasting that our, our revenue uh, uh, will decline around 8% in this fiscal year. This is a huge impact to us. Uh, uh, as we gradually reopen our facility across the world, uh, one of our biggest challenges is ensuring the safety to our employees and their families. To do so, uh, we are making significant changes in the design of our factory and the offices so that sufficient spacing exists and personal protective equipment is uh, available. And uh, as for the, uh, my recommendation uh, in the uh, pandemic driven world that we are facing is uh, manufacturers uh, should create the solution that offer an added layer of safety to the product that we produce and find new uses for existing technologies. And our Randy Labs, as well as Innovation Center in Japan and Silicon Valley, are now working toward uh, developing these new technologies and uh, bringing them to market as soon as possible. And for example, to minimize uh, contact with the virus uh, transmission surface, our latest generation of the elevator uh, can be equipped with a touch-free technology uh, that uh, connect with your smartphone to eliminate uh, uh, the need to uh, interact with any uh, elevator surface area until the destination floor to arrive. So uh, we are hopeful that the other product that we manufacture can be further engineered so they uh, contribute to the fight against COVID-19. So uh, uh, in addition to this, uh, Mitsubishi Electric has joined the, uh, several with the several other companies and organizations in signing the Open COVID-19 Declaration for the intellectual property. So uh, uh, this uh, group uh, of the company in Japan has preached that during this uh, pandemic period, we will not assert any patent rights for products that could contribute to stopping the spread of COVID-19, including for diagnosis, uh, prevention, containment, and treatment. We opened the IP free to use for this specific objective. So as Mr. Kai Fu Li mentioned, digitalization and using AI technology to be deeply applied in the future to work for the COVID-19 to protect our own intellectual property in the field of AI, 5G, precise GPS location systems, and uh, thermal imaging and so on could contribute to fight against COVID-19. In closing, uh, let me know that uh, it is important that the private sector uh, work together with government and the scientific community in eliminating COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Hora. And now we're gonna turn to Terry Tsao from Semi Taiwan. Uh, good morning and uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Terry from uh, Semi. Uh, Semi is a global uh, industry association. Uh, we serve the semiconductor and the microelectronic uh, industry society. So uh, we have around uh, 2,000 members around the world. So uh, we get sometimes uh, get some uh, first-hand information about the industry dynamic and also uh, the 
like uh, their latest uh, feedback about the COVID-19. Uh, in terms of the uh, uh, COVID-19, this pandemic, uh, I think in the short term, uh, actually, uh, semiconductor industry, uh, we don't really uh, get the uh, severe or like a big like hit. Uh, the reason why is actually uh, from the men's side, uh, we we see uh, because of the uh, uh, pandemic, actually uh, we have more uh, like uh, electronic usage, like uh, everyone work from home, so that you need more like uh, either the hardware or you have to uh, subscribe the uh, internet service or like like us, we have the uh, uh, video conference or even we as an association, we traditionally, we host the uh, uh, physical uh, trade show and the conference. Now we have to do the virtual uh, conference or virtual trade show even for the hybrid type of the event. So actually from the men's side, we don't see the uh, big uh, like a slowdown at this moment for the other electronic product. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, this is from the men's side. The, from the uh, supply side, uh, actually uh, for the uh, high-tech uh, manufacturing industry, especially uh, semiconductor industry, uh, it's already uh, kind of fully automation. Uh, so uh, most of the fab and also the uh, fab manufacturing process uh, is already being autom automated. So uh, actually, uh, either from the demand side or from the supply side, uh, at this moment, uh, we don't see the uh, significant like impact uh, in, in the in the short term. Uh, like I check with uh, most of the famous like uh, foundry, um, number one foundry in Taiwan or number one like uh, outside packaging house in Taiwan, they're very good business in the first quarter or second quarter. Of course, in the long term, probably this pandemic uh, make the people like uh, uh, worry about the future, begin to like slow down the purchasing, uh, more conser conservative about the spending. But uh, at this moment, uh, most of the uh, supply side or the manufacturing side, uh, we kind of stay in the uh, uh, optimistic, uh, cautious optimistic situation. But uh, going forward, we definitely believe that, uh, especially in manufacturing uh, industry, uh, how we uh, adapted or leverage the concept of the smart manufacturing, or we talk about the industrial uh, 4.0, I think definitely that will be the uh, big driver for most of the company that will uh, manufacturing industry, they will elevate their uh, facility. Uh, take semiconductor uh, manufacturing, the foundry or the fab, for example, actually only very, very few people, they work in the fab. It's already fully automation. And also uh, we can place the recipe and the place the order uh, from remote. So uh, some, for example, some Taiwanese uh, semiconductor manufacturing company, they have the fab in China. So mm -hmm. when China, they have some like a pandemic, like a spread out, Actually, the staff, they can work from Taiwan, they place the order, they can buy the cloud and the remote to control the machine equipment uh, who can, uh, based on the instruction to do the production in China. So definitely we can foresee in the uh, manufacturing industry, especially high-time manufacturing industry, the driver will be very strong to facilitate uh, the company to enhance how to do the more automation, uh, smart manufacturing. I think there will be the big trend for the uh, manufacturing uh, industry. And uh, of course, on the other hand, uh, from the application side, uh, the 5G, AI, and also the smart med tech will be the driver for the uh, demand side. Uh, definitely, those are the big factor will drive the semiconductor industry for the bigger usage uh, in the coming future. So that's my summary uh, for the overall uh, about the uh, manufacturing industry and the high-tech manufacturing industry. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Tsao. And our last panelist is Robert Greaves from the American Chamber of Commerce in Hong Kong. Welcome, Robert. 
Thank you. Uh, good morning and good evening to you all. Um, the American Chamber has about 1400 members, half of whom are non-American. Uh, and when we look at, at Hong Kong, uh, as Dr. Lung said in the earlier presentation, Hong Kong has done a very good job in containing COVID-19. Um, and it's part of this is because of SARS. Part of it is because uh, they had that experience. Uh, the people are, are compliant and disciplined in Hong Kong. They also were, were by themselves uh, cleaning uh, subdivided housing for free for poor people, which was fantastic. So the great volunteer spirit, the medical establishment here is great. When we turn to the economic sphere, um, as the previous two speakers were talking, there's a lot of great stuff with blockchain, AI, high tech uh, that could help uh, uh, areas out of the, uh, the, the virus situation, the pandemic going into the future. In Hong Kong, not the case so much. And I wanna focus on um, leisure, uh, food and beverage, also uh, property and the airline industry. So if you look at food and beverage and leisure, uh, we are dependent, we're a world city, we are dependent on tourism, we are dependent on people from mainland China coming down and using our facilities, tourism, going into the shops, going to the bars and restaurants, going into the hotels. And all of this has, has been stopped in its tracks. The economy has contracted at 8.9% year over year. Um, the, just to jump to, the, to Cathay for a moment, they are 96% down in their capacity in part by design. Uh, because the other factor here you, is you don't wanna have a second wave of infection. And that's another part of this equation. So we have had a number of, you can see in the Soho section of, of Hong Kong, also in Nutsford Terrace, in TST across the water, boarded up shops, uh, restaurants closed, bars closed. Many of these will never open, thousands of these across Hong Kong. Many of them will never open again. This is a huge impact on a city that's been known for its F&B. The hotels are in single digit occupancy right now. Uh, and they're having to basically wall off sections of the hotel and uh, people are not staying there. So this is, a, this is a big drag on the economy. When it comes to uh, property for a minute, I'll just dwell on this for a minute. Um, property is a really important part of, of Hong Kong. Uh, prices are coming down in terms of commercial real estate and residential, but probably not fast enough. And, and the example of this is a big realtor just the other day had to pull, uh, pull out of selling lots on the old Kai Tak airport uh, on the uh, TST side of, of the harbor and, and uh, lost money. This, this doesn't happen in Hong Kong and it's happening now. And when you turn to uh, the airlines, Cathay Pacific really is a poster child for Hong Kong's dilemma, which is a basically based on 19th century industries, finance, real estate, uh, that sort of thing. The, the, the two previous speakers were talking about all the things that are developed across Shenzhen Bay and Shenzhen, but not in Hong Kong. And this is something we talk about, will Hong Kong have to reinvent itself uh, post pandemic? And how do you do that? And how do you work with other cities in the greater Bay Area to do that. So uh, I'm not introducing great uh, ideas for getting out of the situation. I'm actually identifying three problems that the Hong Kong government and the Hong Kong people have to deal with. And I will, I will stop right there. Okay, thank you very much, Robert. Since we have five panelists, what I'd like to do is I have a couple of questions, but I wanna try to avoid having all five panelists answer the same question. So I have a manufacturing question I'd like to address to Kai Fu Li and Mr. Hora and Mr. Tsao. And then I have a separate question I wanna to direct toward Jane and Robert. So starting with Kai Fu Li, the manufacturing question, the pandemic has definitely started a lot of talk about reshaping value chains that firms, you know, might be rethinking and having such global value chains. And then I think that intersects with this trade war between China and the US. 
leaving China. Uh, Japan has some stimulus money for Japanese firms to return back to Japan. Uh, so looking past the immediate crisis, do we really think global value chains are going to And, and how do you see them changing over, say, a five or 10 year time horizon, starting with Kaiku Li? Uh, okay. Well, China ha is the world's um, manufacturer. I think it's be becoming the world's um, most uh, high quality manufacturer over the last 20, 25 years. And I think that role is not going to be very easy to replace. There are some lower cost electronics and products that have been shifting to Southeast Asia um, and, other, and South America and so on. But uh, I know many companies in the US uh, that really depend on China for building quality products. And I think that shift will be difficult. Uh, I, I, and this, uh, however, I also see determination uh, in the US government to try to change the supply chain and reduce the dependency on China. Uh, so we'll see how that plays out. I think obviously there are uh, risks uh, if certain key things aren't manufactured in China anymore are moved off. We see the news about Taiwan Semiconductor recently, for example. Uh, but at the same time, there is also an opportunity to build a separate and parallel supply chain uh, with Belt Road Initiative, helping the developing countries, building products for Middle East, um, Africa, uh, uh, Southeast Asia, and so on. So I think it's, uh, it's hard to tell. I think China has some challenges, but also some opportunities, and it has a strong hand in this game at this point. A quick follow-up for Mr. Lee. Uh, the very speculative, but looking in terms of the... Uh, think the pandemic is more important or the US-China trade war is more important in how value chains evolve in the next five to 10 years? Uh, I think both are causing the globalization to become uh, undone and uh, both are important, but uh, I think the sentiment from U.S. about China and the determination in a bipartisan way is probably the largest challenge uh, right now. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Hora, in your opening remarks, you were emphasizing Mitsubishi's global reach with factories in China, factories in the US, you know, how do you see value chains evolving in your sector over the next five to 10 years? Uh, uh, that is a great question. But as uh, Mr. Lee mentioned, we also have a lot of over 30 uh, factory operation in China and also the Asia as well. Uh, uh, then uh, uh, it's not easy to shift. Maybe some certain level of shifting, but not only for the US, China uh, trade war, but uh, for the optimization of the uh, supply chain, we will always consider about that. So of course, the tariff is one of the uh, uh, factor to consider about that. Uh, Terry Tao, what is your view about how value chains might evolve in response to both the virus and this US-China tension? Yeah. Uh, I think uh, during the time uh, when the virus outbreak, uh, we did uh, do the very quick survey about our uh, global uh, 2000 uh, semi member around the world about the diversify uh, the supply chain. I think uh, 60, more than 60%, they do uh, have the intention uh, to consider to diversify not specific one region. Of course, China is one region, but in general, this pandemic really uh, give the very like strong uh, signal for the, all the uh, manufacturing company to consider about uh, they should diversify the supply chain. Uh, however, on the other hand, uh, in semiconductor industry, uh, we have to say that uh, the, the trade war between the US and China actually uh, make the semiconductor supply chain uh, facing the very difficult uh, uh, challenge. Because in our uh, semiconductor industry, actually this industry is very, uh, by each industry segment, just very separate into uh, uh, around the world. For example, probably the system company, 
like uh, Xiaomi, Huawei uh, in China or the Apple in US and uh, they use the uh, IC design chip from Qualcomm uh, from US by the manufacturing by TSMC in Taiwan, packaging house in uh, SE in Taiwan, but SE and the, the, and the TSMC, they use most of the uh, American companies as an equipment company like uh, applied material. So when we do the uh, trade war, actually make our industry become very uh, in very dilemma situation. Uh, and uh, we feel very strong pressure from the Trump administration. So uh, actually, I don't know, uh, have you heard about it? Actually, this is the, like a breaking news this morning in Taiwan. Uh, TSMC uh, finally decided to show the intention to make uh, their uh, five nanometer uh, like a fab uh, in Arizona. Uh, so it, it's really from the big pressure from the Trump <laughs> administration, uh, from US government to diversify the supply chain. Uh, first of all, probably they want to give the pressure from Taiwan semiconductor industry, no more supply uh, to uh, Huawei. At the same time, they want to have the semiconductor company to make the investment, the supply chain, not only in China, but also in US, so that uh, the Taiwan semiconductor industry, they can be the trusted, uh, uh, like a semiconductor foundry business to US government. So. I have to say, uh, I think both factors really give the big uh, driver for uh, the microelectronic, especially semiconductor industry, about how to diversify their supply chain. But one is for my, for more, more from the nature disaster, the other is more from the, like, uh, from, 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 from administration. Yeah, so I think both are very important factor to, 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 to make the changes, yeah. Thank, Thank you. you, that's fascinating, the three answers. So the, the combination of the natural disaster and the man-made disaster uh, is, is <laughs> powerful. Uh, but I take a point that Kai Fu Li made, about 20% of world manufacturing is in China right now. And that's the kind of number that doesn't change very rapidly. So. It, this is certainly going to affect some specific sectors, as Mr. Tsao was just discussing the very recent developments in semiconductors. We will get some parallel value chains in a few key manufacturing areas, but probably for most manufacturing, we're going to continue to have relatively global value chains. That, that's what I think. Cool. Now, I have a separate question for Jane and Robert. Uh, Jane, you uh, described the somewhat uh, very active effort of hotels and the travel industry, it's particularly in mainland China, to get back customers. But you also mentioned hotels are running at 10 or 20 percent, and Robert painted a pretty grim picture. So I, I guess I, I wonder, in, in this travel leisure sector, you know, can we really protect consumers and workers and actually have a workable business model, or are we going to see very dramatic contraction in this industry because what you're describing is going to be very expensive and be hard to make a profit in that environment. So Jane first. Sure. Um, I think within the domestic China uh, business, uh, it's on the right track to recover. Uh, at the beginning, the government wants to do it in a very methodical way. So they only allows uh, travels within the same city or within the same province. Uh, but our expectation is after the Congress meeting uh, takes place at the end of the May, they will open up more because the May holiday was the first holiday after the recovery. And so far it went very smoothly. There was no major outbreak. So the government feels confidence that uh, the country needs to be open more. Uh, so if the long distance uh, travel is allowed, uh, we expect the uh, travel uh, will take up more momentum. Secondly, after the Congress meeting, more capacity from Beijing airport will be put in place. And Beijing airport accounts for about 20 to 30 percent of the overall capacity because all the major airlines fly into Beijing and these routes uh, are the major routes between Beijing and the state capital. 
So we expect the capacity to increase anywhere between 20 to 30 percent. And that, again, is a trajectory uh, for us to capitalize on to recover the travel industry. When people fly from Beijing to some other cities, uh, that is also very positive for us to do cross sale uh, to help our hotel, air, uh, hotel partners to get these customers into their property. So in a normal business level, uh, when hotel reaches about 50 to 60 percent of the occupancy rate, they're at the uh, break even points. So within uh, domestic China, we are hopeful uh, into uh, Q3, Q4, they will reach that kind of occupancy rate. Another positive uh, factor we should take into consideration is that the wealthy and affluent travelers who normally plan at least two to three outbound travel to the foreign countries, now we'll look for alternatives within China. So the distance, uh, long distance tour into Tibet, Xinjiang, or the Silk Road uh, will also uh, take these customers uh, because they have nowhere to go except uh, to go to domestic routes. So these are the positive factors uh, for the domestic China travel industry. However, I still think there is an opportunity if government can work on bilateral agreements between China to Korea, China to Japan, China to Singapore, Thailand, Vietnam, uh, even Australia, New Zealand. There is an opportunity we can assign a green health, key, uh, health code to the countries that has very well controlled uh, for the outbreak of the virus. Then we can even inject uh, millions of outbound Chinese travelers into this country. And based on our conversation with this country, they are so eager to receive the Chinese uh, consumers, Chinese travelers, because their airport, their airlines, their hotels are built to host a lot of Chinese customers, uh, anywhere between 20 to 30, 40% of the inbound tourists are from China. So again, that is an opportunity. It's not easy to achieve, but uh, we should be able to uh, accomplish this goal if we work closely with uh, each other. Thank you, Jane. Robert, you talked about Hong Kong reinventing itself. So, so what might that look like? Well, it might mean uh, it might mean more interaction with Shenzhen and and becoming more of a um, uh, working with technology companies, maybe having some technology companies in Hong Kong. Uh, remember Frank Wong, who invented DJI, actually was educated at HKUST, but had to go to Shenzhen because he couldn't find the employees or the infrastructure he needed to start his uh, drone company. So the people are looking at that idea. They're looking at what to do with the terminals, the cargo terminals. Uh, there's also a huge healthcare component uh, that is grown out uh, that is growing out of the uh, very world class and terrific um, hospital and healthcare system in Hong Kong. So biomedical, biotech, these are these are areas for the future of Hong Kong. Uh, I liked what Jane was saying, her very positive statements, and she was alluding to uh, some sort of system. I think she was alluding to testing and then having sort of some sort of certificate or something that people can carry around with them. I think that's a great idea. I am being pessimistic now because the Hong Kong authorities are, are being very stringent. They want 28 days with no new cases and no imported cases before they start to lift restraints. We got to 23 cases just recently, but then we had three more cases that were imported. So I think it's coming. And of course, vaccine is on the other side of this, but that could be 18 months, two years, whatever down the road. So uh, I, and David, I just wanna emphasize that Hong Kong is a world city and it is dependent on the world as are the other locations we're talking about here, but it is very much dependent. And the airlines and the leisure and hotels uh, industry uh, and even property are dependent on having people moving in and out of the city. So um, I, I think uh, once we have that nailed, especially the testing, I think things can move forward. A 
public. And this one I have, I think maybe uh, all of you may want to comment on, but I'm going to you know, start again with Kai Fu Lee. Uh, so Eric, who's a PhD student at the University of British Columbia, yeah, he, he wants to know how all of this is going to affect talent migration. And his question is specifically about talent migration into Asia. Uh, but I'm also curious about talent migration out of Asia. Uh, certainly the United States economy has been dependent on a lot of high skilled immigration coming from Asian countries to the US. You know, how, how do we see that whole mixing of talent changing, uh, starting with Kai Fu Lee? Uh, okay, I have been hearing more and more about American schools taking fewer uh, Chinese students, especially in the high tech areas. That's likely to happen, and that means the Chinese students will either stay at home or go to other countries. That's one, one possible migration. Another is uh, uh, the continuing uh, Asian Americans, Chinese Americans being uh, treated unfairly in the US. So far that hasn't led to any exodus, but I would say that's also a factor. In terms of foreign um, talent coming to China, that's all, always been a very small number and I don't imagine that would be material. Jane? Yes, uh, we have been promoting inbound travel, uh, travel. So in the very recent uh, announcement by the Prime Minister's office, uh, many of our proposals has been adopted uh, in, the, in the country's policy. Uh, I think a lot of our friends, before they come to China, they have, uh, a little bit uh, uh, misunderstanding about China, but once they are there, they saw the high-speed railway, they had, they saw the high buildings, uh, wonderful schools, etc. The impression changes quite a lot. So what we did for the government is a couple of things. Uh, first of all, they need to uh, establish online visa uh, to ease the application for the travelers. Uh, secondly, we need to make uh, more hotels available, open for foreign visitors. Uh, right now, only 20-30% uh, of the hotels are available for foreign uh, visitors. And thirdly, the payment uh, for China right now uh, is very uh, uh, much linked to WeChat Pay and Alipay, but for foreigners, it's a little bit difficult to get through. So there are about 10 items we recommend the government to make it easy for people to travel into China. And then we also recommend government to have an open, de open door policy to attract more students all over the world to study in China. Uh, so this, I think, is going to be an opportunity for us to move forward for for that because right now China seems to be the, uh, the safest uh, uh, country uh, to attract students to China. Mr. Hora, do you have some thoughts about how the problems with migration? Yeah. Of course, uh, uh, those restriction of the travel trip is also affect to us a lot for our, our business. So uh, we also have a lot of operations, and also that we have are uh, sending a lot of our company employee uh, force uh, working in China, and also we are dispatching uh, our uh, company employee as a student or a study or uh, analyze uh, to join the R and D in China. So we also have R and D facility in China, and also we have the one uh, in US as well. Therefore, those are both China and US, Japan, and such a huge industry and economy, and also the technology center, uh, it's better to work together, especially for such a tough situation uh, uh, to fight against uh, COVID-19. That is my recommendation. Mr. Tsao, can you hear me? Uh, yes. Do you have any uh, views on this issue about the talent migration? Uh, in the high time industry, probably I, I, I should highlight the other uh, perspective. Uh, uh, in general, uh, we feel like uh, 
actually all the innovation and the technology uh, or, or even the economic growth for most of the uh, country, uh, the most of the uh, power is come from the high tech or the technology. So actually in our industry, uh, our challenge is more like a talent shortage issue, no matter from which country or region. For us, it's more like how we can attract more people to fundamental, they are more uh, willing to uh, join studying the STEM related program. And uh, of course, lots of the young talent, they also would like to go to like Google, Facebook. Uh, they are more like a fancy job, but fundamental like a, in our industry, we always talk about without semiconductor, without everything. So I would rather to inter interpret the talent issue is more like how we can attract more uh, young talent uh, to join the, our industry, no matter from which region. Uh, that's our like a uh, talent migration issue where we more critical in our industry. Yeah. And uh, Robert. Uh, uh, Hong Kong is an open city, so we um, we welcome talent uh, from all over the world. And uh, uh, but the issue is where are the jobs going to be, and what what is the sector going to be where we can attract that talent. And so uh, I think Hong Kong needs to develop areas uh, that will, such as biomedical, such as med tech, biotech, that will attract people from, from other parts of the world. Last question, just briefly, but to make a link to the other panel at the end of the first panel in discussing the resumption of public transport, everyone endorsed the idea of more flex time. And I have friends in Beijing who are going to work two days a week and people alternate different days. So that gives them a little contact with the office and then they spend three days working at home. But without being an expert, my sense is in manufacturing, it's gonna be really hard to have this kind of flex time. So I would like each of you just, if you, if you would like to just address briefly, you know, how realistic is uh, more flex time and spreading out people's commute in the sectors that you're familiar with, starting with Kai Fu Lee. Uh, yes, my company uh, operates that way. We, because we're in the investment business, we're able to be flexible with the meetings we set up. So people are working two to four days in the office and can work remotely. Um, I don't think, as you said, I don't think this will work in every industry. And uh, I think, um, you know, mass transportation is needed. One of the main issues globally is I think looking more at wearing masks uh, as a requirement that's starting to happen, but not pervasive yet. Because the whole idea of a mask is to prevent transmission of someone who has the virus. So it only works if everyone wears it. And I think a lot of American studies have not been based on that understanding and assumption that every single person has to wear it. And that's, I think, critical to, to opening up mass transportation. Yeah, that's one of the things we heard at the end of the first panel, no mask, no metro. Uh, Jane? Our company has resumed back to office to work uh, pretty much starting on February the 17th. However, we make uh, Zoom and off uh, line work available for all employees. Uh, I think internally, because we know each other so well, we trust each other, uh, the online communication really works very well so that we don't have to schedule a conference room and we can call each other anytime. However, certain communications really is necessary when we uh, work with our customers, with the government agencies, uh, there are lots of pent up demand uh, for us to visit Beijing after the Congress meeting is finished. So uh, internally and externally, we're treated separately. Mr. Hora, so in manufacturing, is this uh, remotely realistic? Uh, uh, actually, remote is not very realistic. Of course, design and uh, the or uh, those stage or production planning could be uh, remote. But as for the uh, uh, production uh, factory side, actually, uh, not remote, but for how to auto optimize the number of the worker or keeping the space. Already, we been doing that. 
For example, actually, depending on the uh, uh, load, we already introduced the two shift or, a, or three shift, sometimes 24 hours. Therefore, to maintain the same volume and also the reducing the uh, number of the uh, uh, worker at the shop, we just uh, shift at the three. That is pos possible to consider. And also, the, not only for the uh, 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 production side, but also the, to uh, protect our employee and for, the, uh, to re for restarting, how to optimize the uh, space, we are introducing such as to not to two, three, four, three, four, but divide it into two team or three team or four team. Then the, uh, uh, one team uh, start working just in case if someone, unfortunately not happened yet to us, but uh, if the one person got the, uh, positive, in that case, entire group have to remove and clean up and another group come in, then uh, start working for that. Well, uh, in case if we have a factory line, one line, two lines, three lines, also we do that. If one line being sometimes uh, infected, in that case, we have to clean up everything and to use the another line like that. Now, unfortunately, fortunately, we haven't happened yet to us, but uh, we are uh, preparing for that to protect our employee and to keep the operation stable. That's Thank what you. we're planning. Thank you. Uh, Terry Tao. Uh, yes, uh, I, I think, uh, like you mentioned earlier, uh, different industry where we uh, have different scenario. And uh, of course, some, uh, some industry like uh, manufacturing or even like a service industry definitely still need to face to face on site. But I, my, my prediction is more like in the future, there will be more like a hybrid situation. And before really uh, release the, like a vaccine or all the any like a medical like a cure can be developed, but uh, but I'm not too like a pers perspective, pers not not so like a uh, so 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 I think the actually uh, of course we will continue to use more like a virtual like online meeting, but think about that. Those like a, a solution we do or already a solution for more than ten years or fifteen years. Like uh, we organize the trade show. Actually, we do have the uh, online like a trade show solution. But people still want to uh, have to build up the relationship. They want to face to face. So I I believe once when the pandemic is under control, people still will be very active back to work uh, face to face. I think this still the human like a people nature so i i think in the future of course will be some hybrid model with some virtual things but uh i think don't be so uh, worried about uh that's only like a, in the future we only can wear the mask and only the meeting will be only virtual yeah that that's my assumption yeah so so that's an optimistic note uh, yeah flex time Please unmute. Robert, we can't hear you. There we go. There we go. Thank you. Um, I think it depends on the industry. F&B and service industries, it's almost impossible. I think in my business, consultancy, it is possible. I think it's a mix. It's not all remote. It's not all in the office. It's a mix. People will move in and out. Uh, so you can do that. Manufacturing, I agree, uh, is probably more difficult. And I think in future, there will be more mixing and matching of this over time. Well, we've run out of time, uh, co-panelists, and I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Maria Solis. Uh, I've really enjoyed the discussion, and I'd like to thank you very much and turn it over to Maria. Thank you very much, uh, David. What a dynamic and insightful uh, conversation you've all had. Uh, for me, at least, there were three main takeaways from uh, everything that was said. One is uh, it reconfirmed the importance really to have this kind of discussion that looks at the specific economic sectors. Because frequently we hear about how it, economies are doing as a whole, 
And I think that what this panel has captured is that some sectors might thrive uh, with COVID-19 because they'll provide some of the tools that we need as we move to the online platforms. But for other industries, the hospitality sector, the transportation sector, manufacturing will be harder uh, to deal with uh, the realities of these uh, new disease. So again, I think that we captured the uh, complexity and the diversity of challenges and experiences for different sectors. It also, for me, uh, reminded me of the very important fact that uh, in Asia, we're talking about a very uh, integrated uh, region. And this, I think, presents a set of challenges in the sense that some economies go into lockdown, they begin to reopen when other uh, economies are being hit and how we handle these uh, lack of alignment, if you will, in the uh, cycles of uh, shutdown and reopening. And also the very interesting conversation that you all had about global supply chains, that the trends were already uh, negative because of uh, tensions uh, uh, on the trade front, uh, but then what does COVID-19 mean for a readjustment of the supply chains, but also the reminder that there's a vast amount of existing uh, integration that cannot be easily undone, should not be uh, easily undone. And also I enjoyed very much uh, getting uh, from all of you a glimpse as to what the new normal might be uh, when we uh, try to restart economic activity, the uh, implications of the shift towards digitalization, uh, how we may change uh, 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 the way in which we work and how this work would work very differently in manufacturing versus services uh, industry and of course the all important fact that uh, before we have a vaccine we're going to probably be experiencing cycles of restart and shutdown as we deal with uh, this crisis so thank you very much uh, uh, to all our panelists uh, uh, for those that are joining us from asia i know that we imposed on you that this is a very late evening um, i also want to um, uh, thank David for uh, moderating such a dynamic discussion and to our audience, uh, thank you for joining and uh, to remind you that this is just the beginning of uh, similar conversations that the Brook Institu Institution will be having as we are now moving forward with this project of reopening in America and the world. It's been such a pleasure to host this conversation. Thank you all. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.